Psalm 95, which we read a moment ago, begins with the word of prayer and ends kind of unusually for the psalms. Usually the psalms uh, start at, uh, I mean, they are just a whole psalm of praise, or they tend to start in a low point and then end on a note of praise. That one starts with a big praise and ends on a really low point <laughs> with, a, with a big warning. And it's a warning not to, uh, uh, not to be rebellious and disobedient. Uh, however, you're turning to Psalm 95, many of you, and I appreciate that, but that's actually not our text today. Uh, Got to have us go over to Jeremiah 35. Um, sometimes obedience involves, uh, involves things that start uh, difficult and starts hard at the beginning, but gets easier as time goes by. Uh, perhaps with you like me, it was things like making your bed. That was a big deal with mom and dad, you got to make your bed. That was hard to do as a kid, but it got easier. Uh, or um, maybe you know, picking up your, your clothes or eating your vegetables. You know, and be, and it's, it works that way because sometimes it starts off hard, something you don't like, but it ends up becoming something you do like. Or something that is difficult, but it becomes a habit and a good habit. And it just kind of it just flows. Obedience sometimes works like that. But just as often, perhaps, or it seems with me, more often, obedience starts easy and gets hard. Like someone once said, uh, the command to jump is easy to obey. It's waiting for the command to land that's hard. <laughs> uh, it, it, works, uh, it works that way with uh, that command, Jesus said, love your enemy. Do good to those who persecute you. That's easy to obey until you get a real enemy. <laughs> when you get a real enemy, it starts getting difficult. Uh, I was a pastor, I deal a lot with married couples. Loving your husband, loving your wife, is an easy command to obey at first. And then real life and time set in and... Most couples find that there are times it's a real struggle. It's very difficult. Or Jesus calls us to follow him. And that's really great until we get to the parts of uh, where it says, you know, deny yourself, take up your cross. And suddenly it uh, gets hard. It can bring, it can be difficult, it can be trying and at times it can be discouraging. This morning I want to lead us in a little lesson about faithfulness, which I would define for us this morning as faithfulness is obedience over the long haul. Um, here in Jeremiah 35 is just a delightful story. Uh, I think Jeremiah has a lot of good stories in it. This is uh, an interesting one. Jeremiah 35, follow along as I read just the first few verses. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days, excuse me, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Go to the house of the Rechabites and speak with them and bring them to the house of the Lord into one of the chambers, then offer them wine to drink. So I took Jeazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, son of Habazaniah, and his brothers and all his sons and the whole house of the Rechabites. I brought them to the house of the Lord into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igdaliah, a man of God, which was near the chamber of the officials, above the chamber of Maaseah, the son of Shalom, the keeper of the threshold. Then I set before the Rechabites pitchers full of wine and cups, and I said to them, drink wine. By the way, that's one of those passages that you have nightmares about uh, having to read in front of uh, Sunday school. <laughs> I would say this, but if you're a Sunday school teacher, this is free, it's not in my notes. If you're a Sunday school teacher, a Bible study leader, don't just uh, go around the room and have everybody have to read the scripture, unless they're really folks that you know well and know they're good at that. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, 
for many, many, many years, that was their excuse for not going to church. They had been there in Sunday school one time, or just a few times, were embarrassed to death, <laughs> having to read in front of everybody. And particularly when they, they come to a passage like this, where it's full of names, that you're just going, whoa, <laughs> who made those up? Um, so anyway, be easy on folks. I say that because you guys are probably, most of you, since you're here in Bible, Bible college, Bible school, you're, you're going to be teachers if you're not already. Uh, please be sensitive to those folks who aren't like most of us who are teachers. We don't mind being embarrassed because we've been embarrassed enough. It's okay. <laughs> A lot of folks aren't good with that. Anyway, back to the text, the real point. Um, this is happening. It's around 605 B.C. God's judgment, you probably know, is on the southern kingdom of Judah. It's near Sometime after this story, if it hasn't happened already, uh, Jerusalem falls under siege by Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Babylon. And then it falls to Nebuchadnezzar, and he takes uh, the best and the brightest of Israel uh, as captives back to Babylon, including Daniel and uh, his friends Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, who you probably know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, and then after a few a little uprisings of the of uh, the folks in Judah, uh, it's in 586 that Nebuchadnezzar destroys Jerusalem and uh, pretty much vacates the land. Um, the Rechabites, not exactly a real big name in the pages of Scripture, but they show up here. Who are they? Uh, they were viewed as backwoods people, folks uh, from the, you know, we might think of them as Arkansas hillbillies. <laughs> uh, they, they are kind of considered backwards because they live in tents, they don't settle down, they're nomads, they, they don't plant crops or fields, uh, vineyards. Um, and then of course we know Jeremiah, the great prophet, who's treated with a mixture of respect and disdain, uh, a mixture of fear and ridicule, reverence, and uh, persecuted at times. Uh, he goes and finds these backwoods nomads, who by the way just happened to be in Jerusalem at the time, and he brings them into the grand, impressive glory of Solomon's temple. And not just into the temple, but past the public areas and into the chambers, the private chambers reserved for the priests, those who have dignity and standing in the spiritual community. And there, it's big stuff. It would be like getting uh, Lenny and Lester and Larry and Daryl and, you know, from Arkansas and the hills and, and carrying them off to uh, Washington, D.C., and, uh, and there to take them into the inner chambers of the National Cathedral or even into the Blue Room of the White House. That's really what this is like. And they're having a private meeting, uh, which we couldn't do anymore, but a few years ago with Billy Graham, arguably the most famous pastor in the world. Uh, that's Jeremiah. And that's what it is to be in the inner chambers of the temple. This is huge. And now, in the inner chamber, an inner chamber of the glorious temple of God, Jeremiah the prophet uh, sits them down the table, and God's spokesman places before them pitchers of wine and cups to drink. If the siege, by the way, of, of Nebuchadnezzar is already going on, uh, everything is in short supply. That makes it even a bigger deal. He puts before them uh, big pitchers of wine and says, drink up. What happens next? Verse 6. But they answered, we will drink no wine. We stop right there. This is when somebody gets on the phone and calls Miss Banners. You know, the Miss Banners hotline. Find out. This is a big breach of etiquette. This is just wrong. Uh, if there were other people in the room, there was a big gasp. If there were reporters in the room, they start 
scrambling to pull out their phones to put out a big story. It, Twitter just lit up. You know, it was a big deal. I'm not a coffee drinker. Um, some of you probably consider that a character flaw. Uh, I consider it just smart. Uh, I just don't like it, actually. So I'm sure it's a virtue. <laughs> when, I'm or, when I'm offered coffee, if I'd come in this morning and some of you said, hey, we got some fresh coffee back here and you offered it, I would politely decline. Sometimes I'm in places, though, where I'm sitting at a table, uh, often in a foreign country, and people will put coffee in front of me. And you know what I do? I drink it. I hate coffee. The best place that ever happens to me is in Guatemala, because they just load it with cream and sugar, and you hardly taste the coffee. And I think that's awesome. <laughs> I'm so glad I've never been to Niger where one of my missionary friends tells me that they serve their coffee with rancid butter. Makes my skin crawl. But what do you do in a situation like that? You drink it. That's protocol. That's etiquette. Here, Jeremiah brings them into this room, places wine before them and says, drink it. They say no. Etiquette demands that they drink. There is no scriptural objection to drinking wine. Matter of fact, as part of the Jewish rituals and, and their typical things, wine is part of what they do. It's not a cultural uh, taboo. And here's God's spokesman saying, drink it. And they say, no. It's presented as a gift by people of honor, in a place of honor, as a gesture of honor. Why in the world would they refuse? Back to verse 6. They answered, We will drink no wine, for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, You shall not drink wine, neither you nor your sons, forever. You shall not build a house, you shall not sow seed, you shall not plant or have a vineyard, but you shall live in tents all your days, that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. We have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he commanded us, to drink no wine all our days, ourselves, or our wives, our sons, or our daughters, and not to build houses to dwell in, we have no vineyard or field or seed, but we have lived in tents and have obeyed and done all that Jonadab our father commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against the land, we said, Come, let us go into Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and the army of the Syrians. And so we're living in Jerusalem. Why wouldn't they drink the wine that Jeremiah set before them? Well, 250 years, over 250 years before this day, a man named Jonadab, who, he, he had helped King Jehu, you may remember him, King Jehu, uh, to, and he had a campaign to rid Israel of, um, the northern, in the northern kingdom, to rid them of uh, Baal worship. And Jonadab was a son of Rechab. Uh, who was the Kenite. That's where they got their name, the Rechabites. The Kenites were not Jews, but they were sympathetic to the Jews, and they lived among them, and many, like Jonadab, became followers of Yahweh, of God. And Jonadab told, told his children to never drink wine, never plant fields or vineyards or build houses, but to live in tents as nomads. All of this was about obedience to an ancestor, to a father. And now 250 years later, they're still obeying. The only reason they've come into Jerusalem at all is because they're afraid of King Nebuchadnezzar, who's invaded the land. And uh, they have no plans to stay, no plans to settle there. You know. 
I see a lot of us are a little older. Um, we've got kids. Most of us as parents are really excited if our kids listen to us at all. If when they listen to us, they obey for, you know, a day, a few days. Can you imagine? Not only your kids, but your grandkids, your great-grandkids, great-great-grandkids. They listen and follow what you said. It's like going back to the year 1769. That's 250 years ago. Before the Declaration of Independence and the American Revolution, and in my case, some ancestor named Milton Bain Spa, I made that up, there isn't one. It issues a command, all Spa descendants from now on shall live in tents. And today you come out to Lake St. Louis and you find Keith living in a tent along with my, not just me, but my family, my wife, my kids, and not just my family, but you find a whole clan of spas still living in tents because somebody back before the American Revolution said, you know, you all live in tents. That's nuts! <laughs> and it's, that would be remarkably faithful obedience, wouldn't it? It was. Why does God make Jeremiah go out and hunt out these people that God knows are hanging out in Jerusalem right now? Find them and bring them into the temple and offer them wine to drink. Why does God do that? And, and he puts the Rechabite people, uh, you know, he imposes upon them to get them to drag them into the temple. He imposes upon uh, uh, these folks in the temple who have their private spot, you know, their own, to host this thing, and he imposes on Jeremiah. All of this, why does God do this? Well, bottom line, God wanted Israel at that time, or Judah, the southern kingdom, and he wants us today, as we look back at this, to see and to understand that God expects obedience from his people. Move on. Verse 12. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and say to the people of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction and listen to my words, declares the Lord? The command that Jonadab, the son of Rechab, gave to his sons to drink no wine has been kept, and they have drunk none to this day, for they have obeyed their father's command. I have spoken to you persistently, but you have not listened to me. I have sent you all my servants, the prophets, sending them persistently, saying, Turn now every one of you from his evil way, and amend your deeds, and do not go after the go other gods to serve them. And then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to you and to your fathers. But you did not incline your ear to me or listen to me. God is ticked. He's angry and I would say quite disappointed. Hurt at his own children's disobedience. God's children, his own people won't obey him. But here are these outsiders, not part of God's people, not part of Israel who have faithfully listened to their ancestor for over 250 years. There was never such a record of obedience among God's own people listening to him. 250 straight continuous years of obedience. God wants to draw their attention and ours to that and marvel. And also for it to go straight to our heart and pierce and go, wow. Do I listen to God like that? It's worth noting as we look at Israel and Judah, all the Israelites, it's worth noting that they didn't really outright reject God. Throughout their disobedience and their, and their rebellion, all the things that God is going to uh, punish them for, for the most part, the people of Israel still 
rebuild the temple in honor and would go and offer sacrifices. They would still call themselves God's people. It's just that for the most part, for the most of their time, for most of their day, for most of their week, for most of their life, they would ignore God. They would go and do their little, you know, their little thing here, their little religious thing, and then for the rest of their time, God means nothing. They ignore Him. Instead, they chase other gods. They chase their own way. They chase their own pleasures, their own desires, and set God on the shelf. See, it kind of sounds an awful lot like churchianity in, in our culture. The way that quite often so many of us live from time to time. We don't reject God. We just set Him on the shelf when it's not convenient. And we go our own direction. In that way, they're so much like us, or actually we're so much like them. The reality is that God still expects the obedience of His people today just as much as He did expect the obedience of the Israelites back then. So I want to just leave us this morning with three reminders from this text. Three, three things that should call us to uh, obedience this morning. First is, the first thing we need to notice from this is that we need to believe, we need to trust God's word. Look in verse 13, God says to them, he says, Will you not receive instruction and listen to my words? He's pleading with them. Say, well, won't you listen? <laughs> Again, parents, you, you guys know this, or if you're a kid, and all of us have been kids, we remember hearing our parents say, won't you listen to me, or why don't you listen to me? God is a father, a loving father, and he's saying, well, won't you receive instruction? There's a tendency for people to follow the whims of human wisdom. Just whatever the, the thing is going on, whether it's through culture or whether it's from the experts or some celebrity or whatever else, people just jump and follow uh, crazy stuff. Uh, I've lived long enough to see a whole lot of those things come and go. One, one that strikes me is in the whole area of diet. Everybody, well not everybody, but as we get older, most of us want to be lighter. We got a few, a little too much right around the middle, and uh, and I've watched all the things come and go. You know, there at first it was everything was out there was low cal. By the way, what I've watched is is the the media, the marketers, the merchandisers, the grocery stores, everybody trying to follow the trend. You know, and, and there for a while everything that was on the shelves was low cal, and then that gave away to oh oh no, it's not about calories, it's about fat. And everything was about low fat, right? And then over time,